Welcome. Welcome to uh, the second workshop uh, that we host today. Um, first, a uh, short introduction. My name is uh, G. It's a Dutch name. If you're not Dutch, it's very difficult to pronounce, but I listen to G as well. Halsman is my family name. I work for Eldolet, and my job is that I teach lighting designers about lighting technology, basically. And tonight, or today, I will talk about drivers. And I would like to introduce Scott. Maybe you can introduce yourself, Scott. I'm uh, Scott Gepard. I'm from the Metropolitan Museum of Art Imaging Department. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about multispectral in our program. Feel free to, uh, to join if you want. There are some, uh, there are some spaces there. So um, yeah, you can, uh, you can sit there. So this, um, well, it's afternoon. Um, we'll discuss LED drivers. Um, that's pretty technology, pretty geeky. Um, who of you are in, um, as a, active as a conservator, is that the correct word? Curator? Who, who are, who is in lighting design? Uh, lighting design over there. And um, w w what is your role in lighting, if I may ask? I'm from the Art Museum. Art Museum, also in, uh, okay. Thank you. And there is a uh, aluminum maker uh, there as well. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for joining. So precision LED drivers. This is what I will um, discuss. So first, I'm going to um, the talk of myself, the first part of uh, the first 20, 25 minutes, is about LED driver and how uh, a bad LED driver can cause flicker. Flickering light that has a bad impact on people visiting the museum. Um, flickering light that you don't see, but it has, it can be sensed. And this is what I will uh, discuss. Bad lighting, flicker can cause uncomfortable feeling, can cause eye strain or blurred vision. Some people even link it to epileptic seizures. Um, this is the starting point of, uh, of my presentation uh, today. When we talk about imaging, and this is where Scott uh, comes in later, then we talk about multispectral lighting and the best um, or a good way to basically create one light source for photography in a museum. That's a different topic, and this is what Scott will do uh, in the second part. Right. So, um, when we talk about light, uh, we talk about a luminaire, an LED. Uh, we, I'll only discuss LED uh, today. So it's an LED, um, and I will teach you the basics of an LED when it comes to linking electronics to it in order for the LED to give, uh, to give light. And that's what, a driver, um, that's what a driver actually does. And this is what I will, what I will discuss. So the luminaire with the LED inside. If you talk about an LED, a light-emitting diode, a chip, a semiconductor component, that um, well, this is the way that well, the, 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 geekies, the geeks, if you wish, communicate what an LED is all about, an anode and a cathode, uh, a diode where current give light. So this is a very important thing uh, that I would like to start off with. If you have an LED, um, you, s you run current through that LED and then light comes out. More current give more light and less current give less light. Now an LED has certain technical characteristics. Uh, for example, the maximum current you can run through an LED sometimes is, I don't know, 1,000 milliamps. So if you run too much power, too much current to that LED actually breaks. That's really wrong. Obviously, that's not for you to worry about. That's what the industry normal, uh, normally, uh, normally organizes. But what I really would like to focus on here is that the more current you give to the LED, the more light um, comes out. And the less current, um, the less light. I always compare, by the way, um, electricity and current through with water in a plumbing system where water in the plumbing system is basically nothing else than the current that flows through an e electricity cable. And where voltage, uh, that's basically nothing else than the water pressure in the plumbing system. To make it easily understandable for if you are non-geeks. Uh, so uh, um, but I, I really would like you to, to, uh, to understand that the driver is, an, is, a, is a key element in that, um, in that aspect. Right. Um, a driver. 
A driver is something that is inside of a luminaire, and normally you don't see that. It's hidden. It's uh, totally packed in into the into the metal. But the driver is a crucial thing because the driver basically sends the current to the LED. So what the driver does, it converts mains, uh, so what comes out of the wall, into the current that is then being sent to the uh, to the uh, to the LED. And you program the driver to give the right amount of current to give the light output that you need. So if you want 1,000 lumen, you give it uh, 700 milliamps. And if you want 1,200 lumen, you give them 800 milliamps. I don't know. That's all dependent on the, on the technical char characteristics of the LED, uh, obviously. The driver is a crucial, a crucial thing. Furthermore, in the presentation, I will teach you all about how the driver also dims. Because the driver doesn't only give the current, but the driver always has a technique inside that actually dims the LED. And I will teach that how that actually works. So, a driver, piece of electronics somewhere inside a lighting system. Right. Um, talking about a driver, I don't know if you play golf. This is also a driver. That's not what, what I will discuss uh, this afternoon. And if you're old enough to know who this guy is, he drives kit. That's not what I mean either. Now, what I'm talking today about is nothing else than electronics. If you buy an LED bulb somewhere from whatever supplier, China or from IKEA, I don't know, and you put this um, in a fitting somewhere and you start dimming the LED, there's also driver electronics in that bulb that basically arranges the dimming. Um, so a driver, the electronics can have many different form factors. It can be a PCB. It can be a plastic thing, it can be metal, metal case, and um, I will further teach you how that, uh, how that works and what that, um, what that is. So a driver does two things. It makes sure that the light is switched on and off, easy stuff, and it arranges the dimming. And the different dimming techniques of drivers and how that relates to the light effect that you as a visitor of a museum experiences this is the next part of my, um, of my presentation. So dimming. Who has experiences in dimming an LED? And you're not happy with that. There is. <laughs> George has experience and also there as well. Most of the times, it's, uh, well, all of the times it's related to the lighting electronics that is, uh, that is being used. When we started Elderlet 10 years ago, we said everybody, the whole of the industry wanted to go into LEDs. And we said, no, we are going to electronics, because that is much more important, as important, not much more important, as important as the LED, but it's not as hip, because it's pretty geeky and difficult to, uh, to go into. Nevertheless, if we start talking about proper quality of light, the dimming is obviously an important topic. And we decided to make electronics that dim an LED in, a, in an equal way as that you dim a halogen or an incandescent lamp which is smoothly all the way down to a really low level, to 0.1%. Obviously, not dimming that goes like this. That's not what we, uh, that we want. And dimming without flicker. And I don't talk flicker that you see. You're not dancing in a discotheque on the stroboscopic light. Eh? That's not what I mean. No, I, I mean flicker that is tough to be seen. It is not to be seen by many people, but definitely has an impact on your well-being, does it create headaches or fatigueness or, uh, or whatever. Um, bit of a technology as well, the drivers that we supply are following standards. And Scott will later in his presentation talk about standards as well. And this is also important for Eldolet and for our company. Standards are crucial. We follow uh, standards, so we make drivers for standard protocols in lighting, which is DALI, uh, the Digital uh, Addressable Lighting Interface. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But also 1 to 10 and 0 to 10, those two protocols are for general white light. On the other hand, for DMX, and DMX is a protocol for colored lighting, comes from the entertainment industry. Those are the two, let's say, the three standards that, we, um, that, we, that we've implemented in our, in our driver in order to make the dimming, in order to make the dimming um, possible. So all the way down to dark without flicker. Those are two, um, those are two topics. So dim to 5%. A driver dims to 5, and then you have other drivers that dim to 1%. It goes even further, 
And now we come to the most important point, the further down than 1%. We call that dim to dark, dim to 0.1%. And now we would say the difference between 1 and 0 0.1, I don't care because it's only 1% and nobody sees it. Well, the human eye is in a very low region extremely sensitive, so that means that for the perception of that light, the difference in dimming between the driver that dims to 1 and the driver that dims to 0 0.1 is pretty big. And I have this little demo here. Oops, let me see if I can take it like this. Is it okay like this? So I have here two identical LED um, modules with two different drivers inside. One driver that dims to 1% and the other driver that dims further down to 0.1%. Now if I start dimming this, so this is a 0.1, but it could also be DALI or, or, or DMX. If I start dimming it down, just a little up, and now I start dimming down and down and down and down. And you will see at a certain point that This one stops. Now it's a pretty light area, pretty light room here. That makes it a bit more tough to see. This is a driver that dims to 1, and this is a driver that dims to 0 0.1. It's actually a light difference of 10% of perceived light because the way that the industry communicates about the capabilities of, deeping, of, uh, of uh, dimming, the deepness of the dimming, is related to power and not to perception of light that your eye can actually see. So it's not a question of wrong or right, it's a matter of managing the expectations of what it is that you need to, uh, that you need to achieve. And this is related to this graph. Because this graph comes from an American handbook for lighting designers, gives an overview on the vertical axis about the way that the industry communicates about the capabilities of the driver and percentages versus on the horizontal axis how that light is actually being perceived by the human eye and also by the visitor of your museum if you start dimming down. So if you have a driver that dims to one, it actually means 10% of original light. And this is this demo that I have here. It's not a question of wrong and right. It's a matter of managing the expectations, what it is that you need to see. So if you're in a theater or in an auditorium and you want the show to start and you want the light to dim down, a driver that dims to one is not good enough. There's too much light because you have a big gap if you start, uh, if you start doing in residential areas as well. And if you start working with human-centric lighting, if you start mixing colors, warm white and cold white, the mixing of two colors, then the fact that you can really do this really low, it means that you need to have a driver that has that, uh, that capabilities. Right. So this is dimming. Right. I'm going to teach you about how an LED is actually being dimmed. Because if an LED is dimmed, your eye is actually being, well, I'm not quite sure to put this in, I said fool, fooling, but it can also be faking or uh, they take, the, the, um, the take for, uh, it's, uh, you, it, it's, a it's a little joke because what happens is that the LED, you give, huh, I just told you that the driver gives a certain current to the LED, I don't know, 700 milliamps. And what actually is being done is you switch the LED on and off. So what you do is the driver then switches the LED off to zero. And then you switch the LED on again to 700 milliamps. And then you switch it off again. And on and off, and on and off, and on and off. And if you do that quick enough, you get a dimmed effect. And this is where your eye perceives the light as being dimmed. Um, that immediately uh, explains why sometimes an LED flickers if you dim it, because that's the technology that is most of the times being used. Fooling your eye because of the fact that the current is being switched on and off. It's a matter of how the driver, because that's what the driver does, sends and manages the current that go to the, uh, that go to the LED. I'm going to show you two technologies, actually three technologies, of how an LED can actually be dimmed. Because the first one, I already explained that to you. We call that CCR dimming. Constant current reduction is nothing else than to give an LED less current. Pretty simple. Uh, you don't give them 700 milliamps. You decrease the current to 300, and you get less light. Perfect way to dim. You have a flicker. You don't have any problems at all. But the problem is that in the very low regions, below 
that technology doesn't work because there is not an LED that can receive one milliamp and there is not a driver that can supply one milliamp. The minimum supply of a driver to a, um, from a driver to an LED is let's say 150, 100 to 150 to 200 milliamps. So this technology works in the higher regions. So the industry has invented something else. And I'm sure you've heard that term if you're active in, uh, in lighting as a lighting designer. PWM, pulse width modulation. This is what I just explained. You give an LED a certain current, you switch it off. Current, off, -dak 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 -dak, and then you get a dimmed uh, effect. But if they implement that wrongly, um, well, first of all, if it's really implemented wrongly, the driver actually makes a, a buzz. It starts zooming or buzzing, and that's really bad news. But more importantly, it can give you an undesirable flicker because of the fact that I just explained to you on and off and on and off. The fact that there is repetitiveness in that modulation uh, can make sure that there is something that is, has a negative impact on, on your brain and on uh, how, you, how you act. And I'm going to show you, and I'm going to sell, first of all technology, but now I'm going to tell you how we as Elderlet have changed that and how we've improved the modulation technique in our drivers to avoid that, to avoid flicker. And we call this, excuse me, and we call this hybrid hydro drive dimming technology in all of our drivers. And we do three things differently if you compare that to traditional PWM drivers. First of all, we don't switch the LED off anymore. So we don't modulate between 700 milliamps and zero. We modulate the current between 700 milliamps and 400 milliamps. So we make the amplitude in current smaller. I will later explain why we do that. So we don't toggle like this, but we toggle like that. Small amplitudes, that's one. Secondly, we modulate in um, uh, frequencies which are pretty high. I already told you, the quicker you do that current modulation, the better it is. But thirdly, and that's actually the most important differentiator, we don't modulate the current in fixed frequencies. So it's not on and off and on and off fixed. No, it's variable. We make variable frequencies. So the fact that the repetitiveness of the current is less, you immediately understand if you have less repetitiveness, you have less flicker. Because the idea of flicker is that it, it's every time the same. And now we change the, the, uh, the frequencies, if you wish, the variation frequency, which decreases the amount of flicker in the, um, in the light. So it means variable frequencies where the lights are not switched off with high frequencies as well. And this is what we do, and that results in the fact that we can dim all the way down to dark, and we can dim without noticeable flicker. And that's my next topic. My next topic is flicker. So, is it an issue in the industry? Well, there's a big turnout, uh, turn, uh, turnout here, so yes. If I talk to lighting designers, um, there's concern about if it's good enough to work under LED lights. Is it good enough for me to work under? Um, it can create headaches, fatigueness, blurred vision, eye strain, some people link it to epileptism. I hope that's correctly pronounced, by the way. Or even autism. Well, I'm not a doctor, not at all. I'm just a geek uh, explaining you what an impact it might have on, um, on, uh, on your brain. More importantly, how do you prevent it? And that's pretty simple. There's a recommendation out there. It's a standard. And Scott will uh, later in the story also talk about standards. So this is why we try to open up as Elderlet, the IEEE 1789 standard. I will communicate that later in the story. But first, I would like to invite you to come to my roulette table, because I have a roulette table here, and I will switch that on now, in which I make invisible flicker visible for you. So if you come towards this side, I'll give you a short demonstration. And you have some time to... Um so this roulette table is um, a little demo to make you aware, to make people aware of that light is not always good and healthy light. I have here one LED module. And to be honest, I don't care about the brands. Um, and in this cabinet, if you wish, I have four different pieces of electronics. So four different drivers. One good one and three bad ones. And I'll show you with a bad one, so then I'll change that. And then you think it's regular light, and it is regular light, but it's not good. But first I'll show you a good one. So this light is on, 
And if I dim this light down, so basically the roulette table, I started uh, doing this down. And if you dim the light down, you actually see that it remains nice and homogeneous. You don't see any, any issues. So this is example number one. I will change driver. So now I will press a button and I will go to driver number one. And if I dim this down again, you actually see that the light flickers. Because of the fact that the modulation in the current from the driver to the LED, it's the same LED driven differently, and that's really bad news. And again, I have a third driver as well, and also here, regular light, and it uh, flickers. So the reason why I'm doing this is that if you're in a museum or if you're a lighting designer, you have the choice to basically specify light that is objectively flicker-free. I always say to my customers, don't believe what I say. You never should believe, well, that's not completely true, but there's a lot of um, uh, blah, blah around, uh, around, around flicker. What, what I'm trying to do is make that objectifiable for you so that you can find and follow regulations so that you can specify light that is objectively flicker-free according to the IEEE 1789 standard. I just had somebody here um, from the States. Uh, he worked together with Naomi Miller and she is like, um, uh, she works in the American Department of Energy and they are the ones, she's the, well, the, the fighter, if you wish, for the IEEE standard in order to, uh, to, uh, to make that happen. I will teach you later what that, uh, what that means. Nevertheless, this tool is all about um, uh, uh, flicker. Stefan, could you um, press on the, uh, then, then we will remain standing here. Flicker is two things. So before we, um, uh, I'm going to show you why this is uh, so bad. If you look to the, to the slide, flicker has two aspects. The first, the lower aspect of flicker is the frequency. I already told that to you. The quicker you have the modulation, the better it is. Eh? It's, that's pretty easy. But the, that's a very important topic in flicker that not a lot of people know. It's called the flicker percentage. And the flicker percentage is actually the size of the pulse. So if you modulate between 700 milliamps and zero, you have an amplitude of 700 milliamps. That's pretty big. If you decrease the amplitude, so by not switching the LED off anymore, you actually decrease it to, let's say, 200 milliamps, that decreases the amount of flicker in light. And these two aspects, so the flicker percentage, that's the amplitude, and the flicker frequency, that is the, um, well, that's the speed of the modulation, Stefan, could you, sorry, press, sorry to, thank you. This is exactly the IEEE recommendation. And the IEEE, sorry, one second. So, so the, the, the yes. So the, the flicker percent of yeah. flicker, how do you call it, uh, the, the reducing the amplitude? Amplitude, the, it's a flicker percentage. Flicker so flicker percentage. The, the flicker percentage related to the. So that's the second chart, yeah? yeah. No, the, 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 the first one, that's the flicker percentage, that's the amplitude. Yeah, exactly. Peak to peak amplitude. So and the second one, the flicker frequency, that is the speed yeah. of, the of the current modulation. Frequency, yeah. That's the frequency, if you wish. Now, um, the graph that the IEEE 1789 recommendation is a graph. And I'm here to explain to you why we follow that. Because the graph is on the horizontal axis, you see the frequency. And on the vertical axis, you see the flicker percentage. And that's the size of the amplitude. So <coughs> at all dimming levels, um, you can put the frequency components in this graph, and if they're in the green or in the yellow area, the <coughs> flicker that is being produced is non-noticeable by the human brain. It is okay to work under that light. If you're in the red area, it actually means this. It is noticeable, and please don't work under that light because it's not good for you to work under that, uh, to work under that light. The drivers that I'm using here, the other ones, I won't mention the names because that is, that is, uh, that is, that is, not, that is not fair, are pretty high-end brands because the, 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 let's say the knowledge on flicker is increasing and also the knowledge on flicker is not new. In fluorescent lamps, we had flicker 
and now and that was solved by electro by um, electronic ballast instead of magnetic ballast. I'm not quite sure how long you've been active in uh, in lighting already, but this is happening now in LEDs as well. The industry is gaining importance, and there are more driver manufacturers who follow this standard. And the more that follow the standard, the better it is, according to uh, according to us. It's all about creating light that is not bad for you, in essence. Um, we communicate this IEEE graph in our in our um, in our uh, data sheets. There are other ways to measure flicker. You have flicker meters. So you, uh, you, you buy a flicker meter and the, the, the amount of flicker is actually being measured. That's a different way. And some people take their phones and actually see if it flickers or not. That's actually a bad thing to do. <laughs> because a camera has lots of intelligence inside and it's bad for the recording, but it's never a good measure if there's flicker. It's nothing else than an indication. But that's not the truth. Make it as objectifiable as possible. And the actual police standard is, is, a good example, um, is a good example for that. Could you press? Um, so I'm going to summarize my story of just, uh, of just now. It is a combination of deepness of dimming combined with flicker-free light. And it's the electronics in a luminaire that make that difference or not. So uh, the glasses will come later. I have here, if you go into, into um, a roulette table, of course, you play uh, the roulette. I would like you to uh, pick a color. And also for you, maybe you can uh, follow that, give that through or... Thank you. Take one. And also here, that's, that's for you. And you play in the casino and you, you, uh, you, you, you play. There you go. I hope I have... Well, obviously, um, it's not a... Um, it's not a roulette uh, fish. It's not a chip. It's actually a USB stick. Uh, maybe we can, I will give it back to you. You can open it like this. And the IEEE standard is on there. So you can actually read it at home and check out the, the, the true data of the IEEE standard so that you can be aware of, um, well, of flickering light and that the driver, the electronics in the lumina do make a difference. Later, I have uh, some glasses there as well. It's uh, just a toy, and if you have kids, you can take a, you can take a few more. It's a, um, it's a flicker sunglasses, if you wish. But that, but that's it for you to uh, for you to take. I'm just going to dive right in and give you an overview, because uh, after warming up on the first group, I think uh, the takeaway f of the things I want to share with you is how interrelated all of these things are and, and the goal is to try and make things work better. So here we have uh, the Met Imaging Department which uh, used to be called the Photograph Studio. It's been in active operation since 1906. It's one of the largest museum photograph studios in the world and it's amazing with 13 full-time photographers we can't even begin to do everything that needs to be done. But it's an amazing uh, place to be because it really summarizes a lot of the workflow issues that everyone faces. Um, our department, in the traditional photography capacity, serves uh, publications, collections, the website, merchandising, uh, galleries. We obviously do cleanup of uh, backgrounds. And we also support our conservation departments for certain imaging. Beyond that. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done over the past five years, I've been full-time at the Met for about five years, and I worked as a consultant at the Met and around the world for 18 years, something like that. So uh, what was interesting about this journey is when I started at the Met, we, we made an effort to start rolling improved color management and best practice through the different departments that were doing imaging outside of the imaging department. So for example, Asian Art has a little setup and they're just doing collection photography, but they're highly compatible um, technically with what we do in the studio, maybe not aesthetically. So there's different levels of treatment. Uh, I like to point out that uh, one of our photographers that just started doing bronze, which is one of the hardest things to photograph, it, it took her about a year to sort of tutor with another photographer to get to the level that we operate with object photography to give you a sense of the skill level. Um, but we also at the Met have many conservation departments and all of them in some form or another do their own imaging 
and, and this is where I started jamming into the multispectral discussion is all these people are trying to do more multispectral, more investigative photography in their own departments. And so I'm trying to gra uh, grapple with the best practice. And so about a year and a half ago, we started our advanced imaging initiative, which is now I'm in charge of. And uh, basically, all of these different types of imaging that people are bouncing around that you hear at conservation workshops like RTI, uh, you know, hyperspectral, multispectral, these are all I throw into the advanced imaging department because they're beyond the normal aesthetic photography or the collection photography activity. The other thing that we do that's interesting is when special projects come up, and I'll just highlight one that was very close uh, because we, uh, we were asked by our ancient Near East and Islamic departments to help colleagues in Syria and Iraq. And so they were begging for uh, photo documentation. So we created these wonderful backpack kits, which is everything you need, a, a complete photo studio in a bag, basically. And we deployed 10 of these to Jordan. And I was actually privileged to go there and train people on ISO capture. And you know they're actually doing this out in the field for the past year. Uh, and it's, it's, I'm just giving you a sense of the reach and how far our program extends. Uh, the advanced imaging was really a, uh, one of the biggest pushes was 3D imaging. And uh, so we started doing laser scanning, uh, a lot of photogrammetry. And you know, it's hitting in different ways. Well, it's not curatorial. This is a, uh, our rooftop installation this summer. And we basically did those 100 laser scans that were the foundation of this in-house. And, and um, I'm not traditionally a 3D person. A, a, a colleague who just passed away uh, last year was instrumental in kicking us into 3D. Uh, his name is Ron Street. And, and he spent his whole career on 3D metrology and fabricating. So it was just, it's interesting how all of our careers intersect. So here's now uh, a project that brought together a lot of different disciplines. We have a color correct 3D spin capture, if you will, that was used for photogrammetry. But then we actually used an iPhone inside this hollow Buddha to make a form of the inside with uh, photogrammetry and uh, laser scanning. So all these technologies, we have to make work together. Um, and, and that's including exposure and color management and all that. But you know, this was fascinating because it was the first time we stuck an iPhone in something and created a 3D, accurate 3D model. But uh, now we're going deeper, like dental cameras and things like that. Let's go further with that concept. So OK, so this is what's in my head, typically, in a day at work, is this wave of incompatible systems trying to digest that into some logical thing that could be kept consistent. Um, and this is where the standards start coming in. So how do we make a microscope match uh, a Hasselblad camera? How do we deal with all these different techniques and tools that are all, many of them, very proprietary? So we're always battling against proprietary versus our own best practice. And I'm hearing the same things in this conference about general lighting. You know, do we ask for a spec or do we wait till the industry throws a spec at us? I prefer that we create our own specs. And I'm happy that the Met supports my ongoing work with international standards because, in a way, that's the glue that allows us to do our jobs and not keep reinventing the wheel every time we pick up a solution. And uh, for example, in our ISO committee that I'm involved with, which is a still image working group, we are discussing, this is at Apple headquarters. It's Apple, Adobe, Nikon, Canon, Hasselblad. All the, all the camera related people are in that room. And we're talking about, well, in my case, the museum's needs to ISO. Even better, the industry is coming to our museum when we have these meetings and we walk through and we talk on the ground with the manufacturers about our problems. So we're using standards as actually a way of leveraging the industry to where we need it to be, if that makes sense. I, I see that as probably my greatest role. 
And uh, we've accomplished a lot. This, this capture method is really the prerequisite, in my opinion, for anyone doing paintings or flat art reproduction. That's the standard for doing this work. Um, and it's really, let me just grab this. It's uh, based on objective capture and validation. So if I hand this chart to anyone and you capture it, we could use the ISO aims to say this is, at least you can recreate a chart equally. <laughs> that may not translate to every art, just like your lighting discussions, but this is a huge uplift. Um, one thing I'm really proud of is we, uh, and it, it's a tie-in to general lighting and perception, is this uh, L-star grayscale. This is, um, believe it or not, it never really existed before we put it together, but uh, this is the logarithmic values that we see, uh, and it's equally spaced steps up the lab scale. Incredibly valuable when you want to know if a picture is exposed correctly. Hey, the numbers should match in lab. Uh, and we've gotten Adobe to add lab readouts, and we're working with camera manufacturers. This all ties into multispectral. Um, the other thing that uh, I don't know if anyone's interested in my photography rants, but standardized RAW is important. We're working on that. Uh, and this idea of open controls so we can talk to lighting, so we can talk to systems and do more advanced imaging. For some reason, this slideshow gets sticky here. Um, so these are things we're focusing on. And, and again, this is in the context of everything else of maintaining what we have. But looking forward, ideally, um, scene referred imaging is essentially that the image that you create should match reality. Um, RTI is a technique for raking light captures, very useful for conservation. But again, uh, the process is, needs some tweaking. Uh, color management for 2 and 3D is a little wonky right now. You have very good color management for, for still photos, but 3D, it's sort of foggy about, or, or even 3D management of uh, color management of 3D printers. That's all going to have to happen. Um, but today I'm going to talk about multispectral. Because there really are no standards for multispectral. Um, but it's not a new thing. People have been doing multispectral for years, going back to the early days of photography when they decided to do three color channels. That's literally multispectral. Um, the problem is multispectral imaging means different things to different people. So as I talk to colleagues and uh, conservators in different museums or scientists uh, or color scientists, they all have different uses for multispectral imaging, which in essence is photographing something through different colors, essentially, more than RGB, let's say. Um, but the terminology is usually based by what people do. So if I'm a paintings conservator, I'm looking at UV and IR, and I describe it to colleagues as what we've always done with film and the filters we use. Um, and then you can go to a scientist and they're saying, no, we're using it to get spectra response from cameras and artwork. Um, but luckily, uh, a, a nice sort of step towards normalizing this happened at the British Museum a few years ago, where they created this thing called Charisma. It's a protocol to give people guidance uh, on steps. It's like an instruction manual to be successful with multispectral imaging. Um, it's not perfect, and it's relying on essentially people using gear that they already have. But um, what was great is it started talking about what are the types of imaging what do we want to see, essentially? And, and I really love that. So for example, you'll take an artwork and through different combinations of light and filters and multiple captures of the same object, you can get uh, information out of that object that you wouldn't see with your naked eye. And it's usually done with a, any old camera that is modified to have the infrared filter cut off of it, um, where you're passing more infrared. Usually, that's blocked in all cameras. And you know, essentially, you're changing the light sources and combinations of filters to pass or block the light that's coming to the sensor. Uh, Charisma also includes work on the back end processing of that captured data. But I'm not, I'm not as interested in the back end of the data. There's scientists who interpret the data. I'm focusing on the capture.
And, and this is why. So it, when I go home and we talk for the past several years, I said, I wish I could improve this situation. Because what we have to do this multispectral is a camera, and then typically a tungsten light for the infrared imaging, some sort of daylight-ish light. In this case, they're using an LED light. And then some sort of deep UV light. And a, a number of filters that are hard to find and are very strange and fitting to the camera. Um, but more importantly, when, when a conservator wants to do this type of imaging in their lab, it's very time consuming. They have to sit there and learn how to do this process, but then actually during the procedure, they have to flat field the camera and put different filters on. Literally, if the camera moves, they have to start all over. So it's not a very elegant process, but it's really great when you see what they're getting out of this. Um, and I'm, I'm going to highlight one of the techniques that's interesting is if you eliminate certain, if, if a certain pigment is eliminated by visible or a narrow band of light, it could emit light in another region. In this case, something's going in in the visible range and it's coming out as infrared. So they'll put a filter on the camera to block the visible, and they record what's coming off the infrared. And, and again, these terms are you know, interesting. It took me a while to understand you know, visible-induced luminescence. But, they're, you know. but you could talk to maybe someone who does forensics, and they may have another term for that completely. So this is where standards are difficult, because I may only focus on museum, library flavors of what we need, like charisma. Uh, and this is an example of that imaging technique with two different light sources, which is a problem. Everyone's using different light sources here. But in this example here, this was that technique done with a, looks like an LED light, day, you know, like a daylight LED. And then this uh, is with a narrow band 637 nanometer LED, which they just happen to know excites that region of the uh, Egyptian blue that they're looking for. And, and that's really important to them because they can date and understand that artwork from the fact that it has Egyptian blue pigment. I would also like to say that this level of multispectral doesn't diminish the work in the science departments, but they could never do this amount of imaging. But let's say they find something in this survey level imaging, quick multispectral, they can say, we need to research this further and kick it to science. So it actually helps everyone be more efficient. Um, when I first got here, I talked to a colleague and he said, I said, We're, I'm going to talk about multispectral. And he said, well, what's the difference between multispectral and hyperspectral? It's sort of a lead-in question because it's not clear where that definition begins and ends. But some people say uh, you know, maybe more than a dozen channels is hyperspectral. But I, I found a way last night to describe it, um, and that is that when we're doing multispectral, the assumption is that we're not as granular as if we shot 100 bands through different filters or different lights. But essentially, we're taking a number of bands, more than RGB, um, and also usually going out beyond visible. But it, what happens here, though, is when you can start capturing and there's different techniques. I'm not going to focus on that too much. But you can actually extract and use the camera as a sort of spectrophotometer, pixel by pixel, which is amazing. And uh, like John Delaney is someone who's done a lot of work in that area. And I'm not an image scientist. But I've worked with people. Uh, remember, it was the Holiday Inn thing. I've stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. I don't know if you ever heard that ad. But anyway, um, Here's multispectral from the perspective of uh, a Mellon project with Roy Burns, who you all know, I think. Um, he's been building a uh, camera. It's based on a sort of astronomical camera, which has a cooled sensor, very wide range. And he's using daylight sources, electronic flash, typically. And then he's doing multispectral by removing, you know, chopping narrow bands of light and making a series of captures. But his primary directive was increased color accuracy. Initially, it wasn't to do the visible and non-visible like we talked about in Charisma. 
So when we talk about color accuracy, his delta E 2000 on this uh, um, sample is 0.6 delta E in terms of uh, uh, reproduction accuracy. Uh, in the ISO standards that we do for art reproduction, that's usually four is considered good. Um, you know, and we usually at the Met run of under two delta E's for our regular capture uh, uh, quality. But so multispectral is used very much like an Epson printer. In the old days, you had four color channels and you had trouble. And then nowadays, you have printers that have 12 or 14 color channels and the color is smoother and better. It's also interesting with the lighting, the, the more steps in your dimming, the smoother and better. Uh, I fell into LED uh, as usual based on a project at the Met. I was a consultant at the time, and we had to photograph th this early Fox Talbot work that was extremely light sensitive. They can't display it. It sits in a box in the dark, and you literally would have to make an appointment to come peek inside the box. That's how locked down this was. It's some of the earliest photo photographs. And they're still developing. Is they, they, they were never fixed. Uh, so um, there was a scientist, a chemist named Mike Ware uh, from the UK. And he worked with Nora Kennedy in our photo conservation department uh, to come up with a safe zone of capture. And he established that one lux second would be uh, safe for this, which was, in, in the way he put it, uh, 1,000 lux for one second was the maximum that we could do. And that would give us a threshold of, let's say you could do 600 captures before you would see a, a fade. Um, and so what we did is we photographed this in complete darkness, set up on a facsimile. And it was really amazing to see uh, a digital camera with LED lights photographing a uh, a piece of art in pure darkness, you know, and it's like photographing one of the early photographs. It was a big moment in my career. Yeah. So that's, uh, that light is actually where I ran into Eldoled because I was looking for drivers and that's the driver in that light. And so our only relationship with Eldoled is we called and said, do you have a driver to help us? Uh, so the idea of this project right now somewhat stemmed from this conference when I was asked to speak here I felt like well let's do something let's see if we could put a light together so they threw an engine together uh, to start the ball rolling which is what I want to do is that that array of lights on that copy stand I want to just have one consistent light that I can control uh, the light source that's appropriate for imaging and the right power levels and then to combine the work to build standards around not the fixture or the driver, but actually to begin talking about the terminology, to take the charisma and uplift it to a real sort of international standard, fill in the holes with feedback from colleagues. Um, and again, uh, we want to accelerate the development by engaging camera companies not to make proprietary systems, but to say, let's get the APIs of controlling LED into the camera software so we could more easily just shoot what I envision is mm, hopefully as soon as we can getting that system where we can have the conservator put the art and go through a multiplex series of captures, bup, 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 and done. And that's all possible. So uh, I, I had a loose spec of what I was looking for. Uh, I wanted to get as much as I could out of this first attempt to just get some data. So this uh, fixture that Eldoled was nice enough to put together for us is um, essentially it's a 16 channel LED. It's got four UV channels and it's got four infrared channels. It goes from, um, what is it, about 360 to about 1100, which is about the range of the cameras. Um, there's also a good visible in there. Uh, the, the visible light is unfortunately only 3000K, but it's 98 CRI. It's high rendering, very clean quality. But um, in our round two, and clearly uh, what I wanted was a 5000K white. For the lighting people in here, uh, be, we're using this fixture for imaging, but it could also be an interesting test bed for um, illumination because this idea of spectral tuning, 
if you have a good foundation white and then you have a sprinkle of very delicate, precisely controlled colors, you can start exploring that wider gamut stuff that people are talking about, you know, tuning the spectrum. Um, because I think just pure multispectral without that white foundation could be too much and may have some issues. But I'm primarily looking at capture. So I'll just, we can fire up some of the. Um, here's some of the UV channels. It's really so raw. I mean, I just saw this the first time in my hotel last night. So it's, it's literally like kind of crazy. So, um, but he'll just flip through some of the channels. You see those shadows on the wall? That's one thing that, um, that's not in this prototype yet is I'm big into uniformity and um, uh, homogeneous light. And, and you know, one of the only ways to do that is to pack these things tight. So these, these are single pixels that are sort of splayed very far, which is typical of multispectral lights that I've seen in the, all the presentations. It's usually like a waffle, and that's a problem when you're imaging. Um, but these are very high density LEDs where there's actually, in this chip, there's uh, nine LEDs, and they could be different spectra. Um, this one has seven. So the more compact and tight we can make that array, when you flip channels, you're not going to get that cartoon effect. So that's one of the things we're looking at. But um, again, it's 12 channels. We could probably use one or two more in the visible, you know, right here as a whole. And out in the infrared, my device, uh, my I1 spectro doesn't read past that point, so it's not picking up the IRs. But I'll just wrap up with this. If we could get all these techniques running more smoothly, we can start combining methods. And I'll just give you an example of that. Here we're doing photogrammetry captures of a wall mural. Uh, my colleague Ron Street was very into metrology and the form of things, not as much about the color and texture. But this way, you can see the deviation of the surface if it's coming off the wall, if it's degrading. But we came up with the idea of taking multispectral captures and wrapping it onto the 3D model. So now uh, imagine you could have an object uh, and turn it in space and see the damage, the reconstruction, the conservation report. By taking all of these different disparate data sets and presenting them in different ways. So that's what we look at as advanced imaging. And we work with anyone in a very porous, open way. So if you have something to contribute or if you need a certain spectra, our, our ears are open because we're going to be feeding to try and make some working prototypes, then we'll share maybe in a conference the results. So um, I think that's all I have to say. I hope it was useful and helpful just to get insight. But a, there's a lot of parallels in how we're running this and the way we can look at general elimination. Thank you. <laughs>